Thanks for coming to listen and talk with me about my project. My name is Luther Johnson. Um, a little about me, I just recently retired from microchip and most of my career I've done a lot of embedded control and a bunch of arithmetic, fixed and floating point math. Um, but I've always been kind of a tourist and a fan in the, of LISP. Uh, I went to school at MIT for a while and um, you know, got my first exposure there and always just kind of kept tabs on the history of how LISP was going and always wanted to make a machine kind of like this. So um, that's, what, that's what this project is. So what's the motivation? I miss the old PCs, DOS, CPM, things like that. I miss the immediacy. I miss the, the feel. I miss the simplicity. I miss the idea that study it for about a week and you can know everything there is to know about the machine. Um, I like the resurgence in the retro movement and the new maker movement and all, all those kinds of things. And I like Lisp and maybe there's a way to put it all together. Um, so I wanted to make the machine that I wanted to have to run the system I wanted to have and I wanted to make the system that I wanted to have for that kind of a machine. So um, we were talking earlier about you know, the old machines, the console machines, Commodore 64 or the IBM PC with BASIC and ROM and the idea is you just turn it on and suddenly you, know, you have an instant environment and you can get going. Um, and so this is kind of like that, but instead of BASIC and ROM, we have LISP and ROM. Um, so, you know, it's, I'm trying to have kind of a classic vibe, but we'll take the modern hardware fabric and the reliability and the low power and all that good stuff, but we'll kind of just target it and focus it on this kind of a system. Um, with the right recipe, we don't need more than 640K, but um, you can have up to 16 megabytes on this um, of, of address space on this machine. And um, the last comment, I don't mean to be too critical, but um, when I say quality, and maybe I should say suitability for purpose, um, which is an aspect of quality. And so um, if you don't have to conform to all the conventions uh, in order to be compatible with every other machine and every other piece of software, you can make a very simple and rational set of, of choices to get just what you want. And that's really what this is about. Uh, okay, let me just do that. Okay, so why do I like Lisp? Uh, as you all ha have your reasons for liking Lisp, I, I like uh, the fact that everything just fits, working code move, works everywhere. Referential transparency isn't just fancy words, they're actually practically useful. Um, you put something in somewhere else and it, it works the same way as long as you don't mutate too many things. Um, so I like that style. If any of you have programmed in fourth or other kinds of environments like that, um, you, you develop a work style where you code small functions, you get them done, you put them away. It's, that's going to work all the time, so I'm done. So rather than writing 10,000 lines of code and then having heavyweight debugging tools and all sorts of diagnostics in order to figure out what your program is doing, you're sort of correct by composition and you're building up your correctness in your program little by little and all the pieces fit together. So interactive, um, interpretive, like uh, development environments are things that I've always liked and Lisp is also uh, an environment like that. Um, so, you know, you can reason about what your program is doing both in the abstract from the language definition and the concrete because if you know how this interpreter is working, if you know kind of its game, the way it's going to go about doing things, you can just think through what it's going to do. And that can be a very productive way to attain correctness in a program. So, um, and Lisp is very, can be very brief and have high semantic energy density, you get a, which means leverage to me. So I, I like that. Um, with closures, continuations, and low-level macros, that's basically all you need to do anything. You know, you can, you can extend the language and the behavior in the system itself. So when I say functionally complete, you know, you can do anything you want to do in the language you've already got, you don't have to add more to the implementation to get new behavior. So these are all things that I've liked about all LISP systems, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do something like this on a machine like this. Um, 
So I think this implementation is fairly small and fairly lightweight and pretty fast for the kinds of machines it can run on. It's based on an SECD um, virtual machine model. Um, and I'll talk more about what that is. But if you, any of you are familiar with Landon's SECD machine, this is very, very much like that. It is pretty much exactly the same kind of machine. Um, I've just adjusted some of the virtual machine commands, a slightly different set that was more convenient for me to decompose the Lisp expressions into. But it's basically, if you're familiar with it, you'll, you'll, you'll understand it instantly. Um, it's written in portable C. And it's a very tiny language at its root, just a few special forms and a few primitives. But then the rest of it is the, all the higher level forms are actually written in functions and macros. So that's, that's the way it's put together. Um, what the dialect looks like is kind of a blend of common lisp, scheme, and C. So um, the primitives and the, the basic kinds of um, functions they're, they're spelled like and they act like Mac Lisp or Common Lisp. I say Mac Lisp, I mean Project Mac. Yeah. But um, so, for example, car of nil is nil. Car of nil is not, eh, you made an error. You know, um, and I have set queue, I don't have set bang. Now, with the macros, you could very easily make, with all the syntactic sugar, and you can make it look just like a scheme dialect. And the evaluation model is the scheme evaluation models. There's, there's a Lisp one, one namespace. Everything works the way scheme works. But the arithmetic is C arithmetic. I don't have a, an, a very you know, um, fancy, big, you know, every combination numeric tower. There's just reals and integers. Um, but everything combines properly. And then you also have the C standard library, because the foreign function interface allows you to get over to the C standard library or any C that you would like to add. So that's why it's kind of a blend of all those different languages. Um, the goal is to make it very good for very small machines. Um, and I think, I think it is. And we'll just take a look and see what we think. Um, vintage embedded makers. Um, if you think of a Venn diagram with one circle being retro and one circle being maker movement and another circle being microcontrollers and Arduino, well, I'm trying to be the intersection here that, that ropes all that stuff in. Um, and I was speaking before about fourth development, iterative development style. And this machine can actually run CPM. I don't have CPM port on this machine right now, but I will soon. Um, it's based on a processor that is a variant of the Z80. And it has an absolute binary Z80 compatibility mode although most of the things even in the extended mode are also binary compatible with Z80. It's, um, we'll talk more about that later, but it's basically kind of a big Z80, a, a big, with a big real mode, if you remember like on PCs, the big real mode. The EZ80 has that. So um, it's got a lot of possibilities. So uh, the machine itself, well, here is the machine, probably walking out of frame, but um, here's the machine up front here. And um, it's based on a 50 megahertz EZ80. The base of the machine is this business card. And it is the same size as a business card. And please take these business cards when you leave if you'd like. Um, and so we have a 50 megahertz EZ80. We have one meg on this card of static RAM, zero weight state. So it's, it does not hold back the processor at all. Um, an SD card with FAT32 file system, so you can just take these things back and forth and copy your files. Uh, battery back clock. And so this, you can program with this alone, and I'll show you in a little while, but I've got this hooked up to the computer and it's just running all by itself. But then you can plug it into this prototyping and expansion board with this fancy high density connector. And then you can get access to your GPIOs and your internal peripherals, and you have multiple power options. And by the way, you can plug in power in every possible way of plugging in power, and it won't blow up. Um, one will override the other, so you won't back power your USB and blow up your computer. So um, this is kind of the, the guts of the machine. And then I also have a USB keyboard controller. 
And this is a general USB host. Actually, you change the software on here, you can do anything you want with any USB device. But right now, I've got a USB keyboard controller there. And a VGA controller based on a parallax propeller. And right now, it can do 64 colors of um, text. And it's IBM code page 437 extended ASCII with all the nice drawing characters. And I'll show you that in a little while. Actually, you can see it right here. Here's, the, here's all the characters right here. Um, so uh, that's what this is. And there are four different display modes you can use, although I can't switch dynamically right now. Um, but I will soon. But right now, if you program, you pick whether you want, you know, 25 by 80 or 30 by 80 or, you know, there's a couple of other high density modes. So that's that. Let me get this. So um, you can also use this machine as a classic embedded cross development machine. It works perfectly with the Zilog tools. Um, you plug in their, their debugger and you can just put anything you want in the flash. So if you, if you don't want to run this system, you don't have to, you can do whatever you want. But the EZ80 is a really nice processor. It's, it's kind of like a microprocessor with microcontroller style GPIO and peripherals. Um, so it has an address bus and you can get out to um, external memory from the chip. But it also has 256K of flash, so it's, you know, there's a lot of room to run there. Um, so I think that, you know, when I would take this machine around to different shows, people would say, wait a minute, is that a Raspberry Pi or is that an Arduino? And it's, no, it's not. It's, and it's not a general purpose IoT focused product. It's, it is kind of like a 1980s PC with everything opened up so you can get to it. In that Arduino style, but it's really a different thing. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Maker Lisp language and that link there that you can't see, that's a link to my web page that um, um, has a, sort of a quick reference to the language. So if you go to the web page, you can read that document. But, um, and it really just says some of the same things I just said about um, Common Lisp, Scheme, and C. But a couple of things that might be a little surprising in this language. Um, I don't have strings as a basic data type. I just have symbols. You know, it was kind of um, symbols kind of evolved from the early days. There, you know, you have to give the reader a way to distinguish as it's parsing, as it's reading, trying to build up expressions. You have to give it a way to tell whether this is a number or is this a symbol or what are we doing. And so that brought in some restrictions on symbol names. And then you said, wait a minute, I need to be able to have something, an object with a printed representation that lets me use these characters. Oh, so let's have strings. You know, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think Scheme has properties on symbols. And I don't need properties on symbols. And so I don't need all that common list extra junk that, well, it's not junk, but I mean extra stuff that um, are attached to symbols. I just need them to be names of variables. Um, and so, with escaping a single character with a backslash or with quotes, double quotes for a, a string, um, you can make um, a symbol have any name it wants with any number of characters, including nulls in the middle, anything you want, any of the 256 possibilities. So um, I don't really need two different things. So you could say, I only have strings, or you could say, I only have symbols, or they're the, both are the same. but. That's one feature that's a little different. So um, you can have variables with spaces in the middle, and it's not a problem. You just use the double quotes or the backslash. Um, also, rather than having some uh, full complement of different kinds of string manipulation routines, well, first of all, you can go out through the foreign function interface and get the C string uh, operations. And that's one way to do it. But I also have, and maybe this is a time to, to do something on the display. Um, if you, you know, with pairs you have cons and you have car and cutter. Um, With symbols in this system, um, you do car of, of uh, a, a 
a symbol which has a string for its name and you get the first character. But if you want to make a bigger symbol and append a couple of things together and this is a variadic function. Oh, sorry. That was not correct. That's correct. Um, you can put things together. So um, this is also an example of something I'll talk about later. All the variadic functions are done through macros. So there's a primitive routine that usually takes one or two arguments. And then you do the variadic things by having macros that then expand into lots of other things. So for example, I can show you this. I'm kind of jumping around in the presentation, but um, I can do cats. And you see that what that expands into is that. So that's a little utility I have to, make, to keep track of what I'm doing with macros. Um, so let's go back to the presentation. Um, and let me get there. Um, so another thing that's a little different, but not all that unusual, is when you want to evaluate expressions in different environments, um, instead of reifying uh, an environment object or having some convention on what, how to build environments or import or export or anything like that, I thought, well, we have an, a language object that we're already reifying, which is a continuation. So if you want to evaluate something in another environment, just grab the continuation, you know, call CC, return the continuation back, and then use that as the handle to the environment you want to evaluate in. And so that might be a little different from other dialects, but you know, it's the same basic idea. Um, Low-level macros. So I have common Lisp style low-level macros. And macros are very, very powerful, and they can kind of become very difficult mind puzzles. But um, it really is the universal program language extension tool. Most of you are familiar with um, low-level macros in common Lisp, correct? Or, or some of you are? Um, so uh, as long as you stay in Lisp's syntax, which is basically the parens and nothing else, um, you can do pretty much anything you want. Um, just to review, a, a macro is a Lisp function that creates a Lisp expression from its unevaluated arguments. And then what it does with that, because it's a macro, the rule is that after you've created that expression, then you evaluate that expression at the point of the call site of the original macro application so that you get the variables in the environments at the call site. So that's how macros work. So um, it kind of evaluates the expression in line. And in this system, it replaces the original Lisp and patches in the new expression so that it'll always be there. So you only pay the cost of expansion once. Um, I have a switch in, in the system so that if you want to see it every time and you can turn off patching and it'll happen, it'll be very slow. But, but for diagnostics, it's useful to do that. And when you're running things through the debugger, sometimes it's good to turn on that switch so you don't have to see all the low-level primitives when you're trying to, to navigate what's, what's going on. Um, and then the other thing is I have a simplified multi-level backquote. It's kind of like a single-level backquote, but when you use it in nested backquote situations, there is a rule that you can determine from it and follow, and it's a pretty simple rule. So you can do your nested backquote kinds of things that you want to do. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, other features. Um, there's an auto load feature so that instead of, I have a manual load, you can just load things manually and then execute things that have been defined. But if you want to pull things up easier and not really think about it, if there's a .l file on the path that matches in the body of its name with the function name, it'll find it, it'll bring it in, it'll load it, and then it'll reapply you know, fact, for example, to, the, to its arguments with the new definition. So that just makes it convenient. And that's probably not all that unusual. I'm sure other systems have that. But um, it's, it's a convenient feature. Um, there's a forget operation. 
and set etop. These are basically for keeping things small. So macros come in and they expand and then they patch in the results of the expansion into the code. Well, you don't need the original macro definition to be hanging around in memory until the next time you use it, which you're going to pay that big cost but just once. So most of the macros that are used for providing the higher level functions in the system forget themselves immediately after they're used. And so things in the top environment are kind of eternal, right? So you, know, you, have, you, you call a function, you call a closure, and things get defined there. And then when you return, if something isn't, like a continuation isn't hanging on to it, it, it evaporates. But the top level is the top. You can't return from the top. The top has what it has eternally until you do some surgery. So forget is for that. And the whole idea of that was to occupy the least amount of memory in a small system. So I want to bring in the macro, define it, apply it, and then I want to forget it so it's not sitting around in memory. And when we talk about garbage collection, there's a similar thing going on there that, that um, is all geared towards trying to get things to run acceptably, quickly, in kind of a lightweight feel with a system that might have very small amount of memory. So there's one meg of memory on this machine, but when I was first doing this, I was targeting a machine with 128K. Um, and so, you know, it's, these features are there, and you can turn them off, and you can turn them on, and you can, you can have dynamic control over them, um, or just not use them, um, but it all works. So um, another utility is the macro expander I just showed you. And I also have a tracer so that you can say trace fact, and then every time fact is applied, you get a little synopsis of the application. There's a debugger. It's a very simple debugger, but it lets you get in at the low level and see what's going on. And I'll demonstrate that a little later. Um, and then the other thing is there's a lot of examples of the language use when you're trying to learn the dialect because most of the system is written in this dialect. Um, so the, and all, the, all those files are, are available. OK, so what makes something a bare metal implementation? Um, it means that you can get to the machine without having to go through other things. There's nothing, nothing kind of guarding the machine or you know, arbitrating access to it. You can get right to the registers. You can get right to the memory. Um, so you, I don't have, of course, I don't have pointers or anything like that because that's not very lispy. But um, it is a, it's a very simple machine. It's, there's no virtual memory. There's no operating system. There is a C library, but that C library is, that code is really not any different from any other primitive code. Um, there's, no, there's no semaphores. There's no gates. There's nothing like that. Um, you're just calling other, you know, it just looks to you like another primitive that you're calling. Um, you can intercept um, errors um, and, and substitute your own error processing routines. And basically, there's a magic variable called error continue. And you can set that to a continuation. And then when that error happens, um, the original error gets created as a symbol, which that is the value of the error. But it then gets uh, the continuation that you had specified gets applied to that. And then you can do whatever you want after that. Um, and so the break, the control C break, is actually hooked up through that. And you can intercept that. So for example, there's a second level REPL that you can start. And then it catches its own control Cs. And so you can, you can have errors and everything happening in that second level REPL. And it doesn't bop out to the first level. And you can do whatever you want with any of the errors there. So errors and interrupts, I don't have interrupts hooked up yet, but they'll work just like the control C break. Um, every asynchronous kind of um, unusual event can be caught. And so that, that allows you to be you know, very close to the machine and doing things you know, very bare metal, but in Lisp. Um, and then there's a, a feature in the garbage collection. I don't have like any did you know, deadline scheduling or any, you know, guaranteed latency on, you know, real-time latency on garbage collection or anything like that, or I don't have a partition that allows you to run, you know, a certain part of the program in a different garbage collector or anything like that. But it is a very low latency garbage collection 
because once you've kind of put away the eternal stuff, sort of the oldest generation, then there's not really very much to collect in a program that has gotten to stasis, has gotten to steady state. So it becomes low latency because it's kind of stable. And I'll explain that. So it's kind of a cross between generational and right barrier, and I call it the, the corral for the top. Um, just to come up with a different word so <laughs> it didn't get confused with any other words. Um, it's also pretty easy to extend the source if you'd like to. You can add primitives at will in the C, or you can also link out to any other C through the foreign function interface. Now, it's, there are limitations on all these things, of course. I, I only have certain C types that can match properly with the, the list language types and vice versa. So, you know, it's like a care pointer is a symbol, you know. And so, and you can't call a function that wants to write into a buffer because we don't have buffers, we don't have pointers. So you can get most of the C library working properly. Some things you just can't do because there's just, there's like an impedance mismatch and maybe I'll solve that problem sometime in the future, but right now that's, it's kind of what, the way it works. Um, so how does this thing work in terms of the JIT or the incremental compilation? So list expressions are expanded into VM instructions sufficient at that time to continue execution like one basic block or one sub-expression or one run up, sequential run of, of primitives up to a decision point, any way you want to think of it. It's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the VM instructions then, from the Lisp expression that we're trying to crack, that we've decided to crack this piece because I need to do this piece in order to get to the next place where I have to make a decision, um, those are expanded into SECD VM instructions that are sufficient to create the effects that you need in the SECD model. So, um, and I'll show those in a minute. Well, maybe I'll break for a, a demonstration here in a moment. So, then those VM instructions are patched in and they replace the Lisp code you originally had. And then you continue from that point. Simple expressions like a variable lookup or a constant or a quoted value get done sort of in line. You don't have to go off and think of it as a separate sub-expression, which means you don't have to push a continuation and then return from that. They get done in line, which effectively means linking them on to the front of the list that, that you're about to execute. Um, and I'll show you that in a little while. Um, so simple expressions and macros, because you don't know what's in a macro yet, so you assume that you're going to be able to inline it. And then when you do expand it, you may walk back from that. You may push that under a sub-expression because now you see what it's doing. And oh, oh my goodness, there's a select or an apply here. Or you know, there's, there's a choice to be made. There's a more complex expression than I can inline. Um, and so that's how that works. So then you continue with the virtual machine execution until you reach the next uncracked lisp. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the SCCD machine, then I'll break for a, a, a demonstration here. So these are the four roots in the classic SCCD machine. Um, you've got a stack, and stacks and lists are really the same uh, thing. Um, the, everything is done in a canonical representation. There's no compromises, like putting anything on the C stack or anything like that. But the code is tight, and you know, we will do the things that we need to do that have equivalent effects, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so you have a stack, for, which is a list of values. You have an environment. For example, there's two lexical levels there, and x is bound to 1, and y is bound to 2 in the, in the most local lexical level, and the next level up, z is bound to 3, and h is bound to 99, and it's just an association list. It's just really, really simple. Um, and then C is either the control or the code or the command or any word you want to use. It is the list of VM instructions you're going to execute. So this thing is really running kind of like a threaded interpreted language. It's running kind of like in that fourth style. Um, all of the VM instruction routines are just coded C routines and you're just looping through your loop 
Your execution loop is just pulling the next VM instruction off the list of things to do, calling that C routine, returning, go get the next. That's, that's all you do. Um, and then, of course, there's the dump, which is a stack of SEC frames, which allows you to return to where you came from or to return from, to somewhere that you've either never been or came from a long time ago. Um, so uh, this is just kind of reiterating that, that there are times where in the implementation when there's a composition of SECD kinds of operations to do and I can see that there's surgery that has the same effect. Like, for example, when you return from a function, you're meant to take the top value on that stack and then restore the previous stack and then put that one on top. Well, that's really the same as taking the previous stack and making the tail of it point to this value. Um, and, and that's, so there are places where there is surgery done and it's not exactly like a, a pedagogical push-pop kind of combination of things, but it has the same effect. And so we take advantage of that. Um, tail call optimization, I mean naturally in two ways. Um, naturally like of course, but also naturally um, in the sense that it's very natural in an implementation like that, like this to do that because all you have to do is you're pushing a continuation or you're, thinking, you're considering pushing a continuation to return after you do the next sub-expression. But you say, hold on a second, is there any, when I return from this sub-expression I'm doing, am I, am I going to do anything or am I just going to return? And so you just look ahead you're, you're about to put, you figure out what you would load your current continuation that you're about to push with, and you say, wait a minute, there's nothing to do. He's just going to return. So then you don't push a continuation, and you will reuse, you will return to where you need to return from and leave the current continuation in place. And that's really, really simple to do with this. So that happens at the time when you're actually cracking the list, opening it up, and deciding what VM instructions to do and you see that you're about to do, it's like more of an expression than you can do in line. So you're going to do this sub-expression. But you say, hey, when I return from this, all I'm going to do is return from this function. Don't push a continuation. That will use the continuation here so that when this one returns, it doesn't return to the continuation that you would have pushed. And then you return, it's like just returns to this one. So um, it's very easy to do. So there's no big deal about making tail call optimization. So uh, the continuations, some, some implementations I've seen have kind of like half continuations because they're, they're keeping things on the C stack and they're trying to do things really, in fact, there's a pretty good implementation um, that, you know, pretty well used that does things like that. But, and and they're, they're good enough to use in like the set jump, long jump sense, like you sort of like, you know, a global error return, but they, they can't be used in other ways. But I don't do things like that. So when I show you what, what it looks like when we create a, a closure object, you'll see there's just a very natural place. I mean, uh, you know, a continuation is just a way to um, take the dump you know, the current, st the current list of continuation frames, and you just encode that in a, in a small primitive that is going to just reload that dump and then continue from there. So it's really, it's really easy, so there's no need to do anything um, different. So, you know, in the, in the implementation style, it's like all by the book, in the simplest ways that you could imagine using the essential roots of the NSCCD machine. But then when I'm writing the code, I try to you know, write good code and take advantage of available list surgery and equivalent operations. But, um, and, you know, and then we inline simple expressions, so that saves pushing and returning from community. So there's lots of things that are kind of aware of the context of, of how they're executing, but they're still doing it by the book and the net um, state changes. So, um, and then another thing that's kind of interesting is that the nil object, the, end, the empty list object, is actually the VM instruction that says return from this expression. And I use that so that um, a list of expressions 
to be a list of VM commands to be executed is actually terminated by the empty list object so that it can be the empty list object and that is a list and that that that, that last that last atom identifies that's the end of the list but it also means the interpreter can simply just pull a VM instruction off the list of things to do and call it which means that when it gets to the nil atom that is the routine that knows how to pop things off the stack stack pop the continuation reload SCC SC and C and then continue so that's just kind of a convenient implementation trick um, let me let me show you an example here and I apologize, it'll take me a second um, to kind of get this all going. Um, let me do it on the real machine. This was running in Lisp before. Let me give you a, a look at it running on this machine through a terminal emulator. So um, I'll just, let's see. Okay, so I just did factorial, and when you look at what's inside the factorial object, what it is, is the first number is a printed representation of an object which just points to the environment. That's the... Ooh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I can try. Uh, let's see. Change settings. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Actually, using Putty, the default may when you just maximize on the top right. Oh. Is that better? I mean, I knew how to do that, but I don't think the type got any bigger. Okay, so if you go to settings, and yeah. Then, um, I'll add more uh, yeah, that's what I was about to do. So appearance. There's probably a font here somewhere. Uh, if you go to window, uh, which is uh, top up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you look at change the, change the size of the font, you maximize. Oh, I see. That's, that, that may help you. Okay, like that? Sweet. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, so what you can see here is the factorial closure object is first it has the environment that sa got saved with it at the time that fact was defined. And here fact was defined because it auto-loaded when I tried to apply it. Um, and then you have the parameter list. And then you have the VM instructions that execute this. Now I'm going to do this over again. And I'm going to turn off patching for a moment and then I'm going to do the same thing again I'm going to do just this amount and then we'll look at fact and you can see what well, it didn't I didn't need to do only zero but um, so what is happening here here's the environment pointer up front can everyone see that I'm not in the way um, and then there's the parameter list, and then the first VM instruction to execute is load C, which basically says the second argument is the list expression that I want to crack open so that I can go further in the execution. That number there, that 0x59d83, that's where I need to patch whatever the result of that is. It actually is that load C instruction. So that load C instruction has the pointer to itself so that when this gets expanded then the thing the last instruction in the expansion you know will actually you know patch that and so then we go forward so I'm gonna turn patching back on and then I'm going to do fact zero and then you look at fact and you see that the first clause got executed because the n was zero, so zero predicate, it was true. And so we did that code, and that code says push a one. And so 
how you do that in the virtual machine is you there's a one called quote, which just means put that value on the stack. And so it was get zero zero, which says get the variable at you know lexical level zero index zero. Is it zero? If it is zero, you know we select whether it's true or false. You know true in this system is anything that's not nil. You know just like common list. Um, so and then so then you do that. But I never got to the other clause. So it's still sitting here unexpanded. And so things get expanded when they get hit. And so you get a look at what the, what the closure object, what the function object looks like there. Um, OK, I think that's enough for that. Let's get back to the presentation. Um, I'll have to do this. I've never given this talk before. so. I mean, I've given talks, but I've never given this particular one before, so I don't have it all perfectly scripted. Let me do that. And go back to that. Okay. So let's talk about what is going on in the garbage collection. So it's a very basic Cheney copying collector, classic, very good Wikipedia article explains it very well. That's a really good article, by the way. It's like you can code straight from that article. Um, and so I did. Um, and you know, I tried lots of different things. I tried you know, mark and sweep, and I tried a copying collector that actually kept like previously allocated objects on lists, and I tried lots of different things. But I kind of liked this one, and I stuck with it. And, you know, I read over the years, so it's like when I finally sat down to write this thing, it's like I had kind of a, a bunch of articles to go through and things that I wanted to try. So um, it's a copying collector. Um, the reader and the primitives use the other side to, as buffers, you know, and there are, there, are, there are checks and limits and things like that so that you don't overrun things. Because when you're reading, you can use the other side as a buffer for strings and things like that. And then you're building up the expression on the first side. And of course, you wouldn't want to overrun that. You know, you don't want to garbage collect while you're reading. So in the REPL, the first thing I do is when I'm starting the reader is I do a garbage collect. So we have the maximum amount of space to go with. And so that's just kind of a clever way to, well, it was convenient to use all the space and not have to have static buffers that were sitting there only used some of the time. I didn't. I tried to define almost no static data in the C program itself, because that's just a waste. You want to use everything that you can for the Lisp data. Um, in fact, all the data that gets created while you're cracking open these expressions in that in the evaluator, that's Lisp data too. So everything kind of like combines to maximize the one large space. Um, so, as I said before. The top environment is eternal. If you, if you define something at the top, everything at the top and everything you can reach from the top, um, that's, you know, that's going to stick around until you do something to mutate it. Okay? So when I was trying to, when I was trying to figure out like, what's, where's my performance going and like, you know, why is garbage collection taking as long as it does or what's going on there, I, I, I started to notice that almost all the time, Nice, I mean, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but in copying collector, you spend most of your time, time copying things that you're not going to throw away. You know, so that's where all the action is going on. And so here is all this code sitting at the top level just being copied back and forth, and it's not changing, and it just, you know, the pointers inside it are changing, but it's not really, nothing's happening, so I, I'm spending 99% of my time copying code that hasn't changed. So, like, why do you want to do that? So, but I didn't want, I read about different generational kinds of things, and they all looked good, but kind of, you know, complex and with a lot of stuff going on in there. And they didn't seem as deterministic because, you know, aging is kind of like a complex thing. So I wanted something that was really deterministic that would work the same way every time. The same code would do the same thing, collect at the same points, and do exactly the same kind of operation because I thought that would be helpful for testing. Uh, and it usually is. So um, what happens is when you copy the top, if you're copying, and when I say the top environment, I mean 
I mean the um, basically the, the things that you can reach from the top environment. So I have a point, we have SC, C, and D, but I have a pointer that points specifically to the top level environment. And so you, you start by copying that root and everything it can reach, and you got all, everything that's reachable from the top environment. When you're copying from, when you're copying from, you know, I'm going to draw a little picture. Here's how you start, right? Um, you just have two sides, and you're, you're going back and forth. But the basic trick is when you've copied this up, all of this up, the next time when it's, when it's time to copy low from the high side, you just copy the top first, and then you mark it off. And then you make these your new two halves. And so now forever after, you're never copying this again until something changes. And so all of the primitives and all of the, the functions in the evaluator, in the, you know, in the action of what's going on in the execution engine, they know that if you write to the top environment, then like you, uh, you flip the switch. And so the, the next time that you do a garbage collection, you will have to copy the top again. Otherwise, you've got like dead space here that's not being recovered. You know, and also, you're reaching new things that need to be made part of the top for the next time you want to do this. So that's kind of the trick. So basically, once your program gets to steady state, most everything's happening in here and is sitting there and never gets copied. And then the only thing that happens is you know, most of the action in garbage collection is pairs on the stack. It's, a, it's, it's not necessarily new values. It's, it's basically the pairs that existed to reach those values that are on the stack. You know, so, and those things like e evaporate quickly. So most of the time that you're spending, you're rifling through all this code and you're only copying a little because there's only very few new values actually being created in most programs when they're in steady state. They're basically just calling things and like popping things on and off the stack. And you're not actually synthesizing new values, you're just moving them around on the stack. Which means that you know, you're advancing the stack point, the heap pointer, um, but the, pretty soon the thing that was back here is now dead. So when you come to do garbage collection, there's very few things you actually have to copy. And the things you do have to keep for a long time, which is your code, is now sitting down here and it's not moving. So that makes it more effective. So it's kind of like a generational thing. But instead of making an aging define this generation, you make it, is it reachable from the top? That's the test. And it's kind of like a right barrier thing. But instead of being a generational scheme, it's just the right barriers. Is it defined in the top? And that's, so that's the trick. And it, it has been effective for me. But you can turn it off if you want. It's, there's an option for it in the source. And you can turn it off and see the effects. So that's the trick on garbage collection. Um, the other thing to note is that I don't check for whether I need to garbage collect every time um, I make a new value, which you know some implementations will do that. They'll advance the heat pointer and then they'll say, oh, do we run out of space? Do we have to garbage collect? Instead, I check if the heap has been extended past its limit at t points, so at the beginning and the end of an expression. And in various other places, some primitives can create a lot of vector, like, I mean, a lot of um, data, like a vector. You know, so certain t primitives can all by themselves create a lot of values in one fell swoop. But in general, um, you're checking at the beginning and end of expressions. And I put a limit, when I'm cracking open the Lisp expression, I put a limit of how many virtual machine instructions can execute in sequence without being pushed into a sub-expression, guaranteeing that only 20 virtual machine instructions can execute and then by empirically noticing how much data each of these things can create, I've put limits in place. And then I have a margin, so I have a guard page. So what happens is you're extending the heap. And you might be extending past the limit into the guard page. But there's enough room in the guard page to handle anything 20 virtual machine instructions can do so I don't run out. 
Um, and, then you, and then at the end of that expression, after it's executed, you say, oh, my goodness, am I in the margin? It's time to garbage collect. So rather than having to garbage collect all the time and then put, like, you know, things like you can't garbage collect now because I'm in the middle of something. You've seen implementations that do that. You know, um, they, they sort of like garbage collect every time they create values, but in certain key things where things might be in, in flight, they have to put bands around and say, no, you can't garbage collect right now because you know, otherwise you're going to mess me up. Um, it's sort of the other way around. You can always create values, and then when you're at a state where it's completely safe to do garbage collection, that's when you do garbage collection. And then you limit how much data could be created in any of those things in the intervening section. And the reason is that it just makes value creation very efficient because they're just bumping the heat pointer. That's all it is. And that makes those runs very efficient. Of course, pushing a continuation and returning for a, from a continuation may trigger garbage collection. But of course, also then, if you inline simple expressions so that you don't have to push and pop continuations, then you get a, around that. So this is kind of the, the recipe. Um, okay, so exceptions and errors, they really just create a symbol as their result. And that's, that symbol has the printed representation that looks like an error message. You know, so if you div, do divide by zero or, a, you know, a, a floating point exception, you get that message. But that message is just a symbol that was returned. And then if you want to intervene and put your own error handler, what happens is the continuation you specified gets applied to that argument, and then you do what you want to do with it. So that's kind of how that works. So control C, what's going on with control C is we're noticing that in the interrupt service routine for the, um, the, e the easy 80s interrupt service routine for characters coming in through the serial port. And we say, oh, it's a control C. And he specified a control C break handler. And then we call that break handler, and that break handler just sets a, a variable in the evaluator so that the next time we, at the same places where we would have done garbage collection, we also check this variable and see if it's time to do a break. And then that causes all this stuff to happen. Um, I've posted all the code. You know, it's on my website. So, you know, you can dig through it. And uh, it's 5,000 lines, but um, it's all pretty simple, I think. So you can also defer breaks and interrupts. You can say, you know, I'm in code right now. I'm in Lisp code right now that I don't want interrupted. Because maybe you're actually talking to registers on the machine. You know, so you can defer those things as well. OK. Um, what, what do you think? Do you, do you want to uh, go into this? Or should we break and go to a, a different kind of more demonstration thing? Or should I only have a few more slides. So what's the room? Or, or do you want to hear about more, more lisp guts? OK, that's fine. Yeah, I just wanted to know what the room thought. Um, OK, so with one level, the back quote implementation works just like any other back quote with one level. But what the back quote is really doing is Every unquote gets respected and gets operated on no matter what, no matter how many back quotes are going on. So you just do what you would do with an unquote, which means you protect it, I mean, you unprotect it, you don't quote it, you allow it to be evaluated. I'll show you the example in just a second. Um, so you observe every leading leftmost unquote exactly like you would in a single level. Even if you have had several um, back quotes going on. So then if you want to defer something from being unquoted at that level, you prepend, you put in front of it an unquote quote, which causes that unquote to cause that to be evaluated, but you've quoted it, so you get the thing to match. So, this last line at the bottom is part of the auto load. And when we do auto load, basically what happens is a stub gets, gets created. 
that's going to cause the file that matches the function name um, to be loaded so that the new thing is defined and then you reapply that same name to the arguments that it was originally passed with um, so that the new thing will actually take hold. So this last line is a piece of that implementation, but I pulled it out as an example because it has two back quotes and it has a deferred unquote in there. If, in this example, if you were doing it by the official straight back quote, and there's a very good article by Alan Bodden that you've probably all read. Um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes things are not designed. Sometimes what happens is that um, you code it, and you think it's kind of going to sort of work, and then you watch it, and you see what it really does. And so I think the original back quote was a little bit like that, in that they put it in place, and people thought, oh, it doesn't really work, but they probably didn't know what they really even meant to think that it doesn't work. You hadn't, you know, all those details of all those cases, and they might not have had completely clear in their head. Alan Bodden, in this article where he talks about the history, says, no, it does work. You just have to know what rules it's following. And the rules are a little tricky, but it's doing what it does, and there is a consistent rule, but I think until he wrote that article and, and did all that, no one really knew exactly what it was doing. And then, of course, people learned how to follow that rule, and you know, life goes on. So what I did is I said, OK, I just want to code the most simple, most direct, single-level backquote implementation. Then let's see what happens when we put it in a nested situation. And is there a rule that kind of emerges from that? And there was. So um, what happens here is you can see the first backquote. And that means that we're going to, all the rest of that expression, we're going to respect those unquotes. So the first f gets bound to the name of the function that you're trying to execute. And you go through the next stuff. And there's another back quote, but that doesn't matter uh, right now. And then you see the unquote file, and that gets replaced with fact.l. Um, and then you have um, an unquote f, and that gets replaced with fact. And then you have an unquote quote, unquote splicing args, which basically strips off that unquote quote, because then when that gets evaluated, you're just going to get the thing to the right. And now you're left with the unquote splicing, which is what you want, because you want this to match with this, but this hasn't been bound yet. This won't be bound until this macro actually gets applied. So what you get is you get what you want. At both places, f and file, get bound with the value that's already in existence at the time the first one runs. But this one got its first unquote and quote stripped off. And now you have the unquote splicing that'll be what you want in order for the next time that you get to this back quote for it to run. So that's, that's what I'm doing there. And if you were to do it with this, the standard rules, the, the first unquote f would be there. And the unquote file would be unquote quote unquote. And the unquote f would be unquote quote unquote unquote quote unquote f. And then it would be single unquote splicing on args. So I, I just, it was a smaller implementation. It seems like a simple rule to follow. And it achieved the objective I wanted, which was something that, would, that I could use to do what I wanted to make macros happen that didn't eat up a lot of space and it wasn't really, really slow. I looked at you know, classic backcode implementations. Peter Norvig has one that he and someone else put together and he's posted on there. And then there's the, the, the recommendations in Alan Bodden's article about how to follow that process to get one. But it was, and I started, but it was a, a large amount of code. And I just didn't want to eat up like 20 or 30K with that sitting around just for this. So I, I went this way. Um, OK, performance comparisons. It's about 30 times slower than C. It's about three times slower than fourth. It's about three times faster than Python. Um, I did a lot of benchmarks with factorial Fibonacci and Takeuchi functions, which are kind of out there, and people use them a lot. It is about twice as fast as implementations that don't have a JIT of, of any sort. 
So there are other implementations out there that are available for small microcontrollers, but they're not quite as fast clock for clock the, because they're, they're just, what? Well, I don't want to, um, so there's ULISP or MicroLISP that is out there and runs on lots of different microcontrollers. And from their own benchmark data and the clock rates that they quote. So for example, there's, um, it, they do, if you do like a thousand TAC Uchi functions of TAC 18.12.6, which is the benchmark that I use, which is the one that's like out there everywhere, um, on a 16 megahertz um, Atmel AVR, they run it in about 48 or 49 seconds. And I run in about um, seven seconds. So, um, but I'm, I've got a 50 megahertz processor and they've got a 16 megahertz processor. So, so take a factor of three away and then you have a factor of two left. So that's kind of how I'm judging that. Um, there's another implementation called FemtoLisp which some of you may be uh, familiar with. And it's a very nice scheme implementation. And it's the basis of a, a product called Julia, which is a language that, that they've created. And it's a, it's a good implementation. But, and the performance, I've been sort of over like the last seven or eight years, you know, every month or so comparing myself to Fem2Lisp. Um, and we're roughly comparable. I'm faster on some things, they're faster on other things. But um, it's a good implementation. And their JIT is a very different kind of JIT. What they do in that one is when they see something that needs to be executed again, they actually drop down and create a basic block of x86 code and then link that in. I'm not doing that. I'm staying in an interpretive model. But then I've done you know, what I can do to make that interpretive model as flat as possible. And we wind up with kind of the same performance. But the difference is they're creating buffers of x86 code. So first of all, you need to have a compiler that knows whatever target processor it is. It can't just be straight C code. You have to have the piece that knows what processor it's running on. And it's also creating data that needs to hang around, which is taking away from data that you could use for Lisp objects. So I wanted to stay straight interpretive and like totally portable C, and I wanted to use all the memory for like real Lisp stuff and not dedicate any of it to be compiled code. Um, and they're roughly comparable. Of course, if you have a fully compiled Lisp, it's going to be way faster. So the, the point of this is not to compete with Steelbank Common Lisp or MIT Scheme on you know, desktop computers. And in fact, we don't really care about running any of the programs you run on a desktop computer on this machine. It's more the other way around. It's like you have a machine that you're creating in order to do this kind of work. Now, what language would you like to run on it? Well, why not a Lisp-like language? And so then do that as well as you can do, but given that you're going to have a mach machine of this size, scale, cost, with these kinds of features to do hardware manipulation. So um, no, it, it will not be a number cruncher like Steelbank Common Lisp, but it might be the fastest Lisp you could have on a machine like this. So that's kind of the, the value judgment or the, the aesthetic. And I prefer it to, I like Forth, I used Forth for a while, but I prefer something more like this to Forth or Python. So that was, that was kind of the idea. Um, now we can open up for Q&A or any demonstration you'd like to see. Um, I've got a price list here. I am selling these things, um, just starting to sell them now. Um, I don't have much stock. You've, you can see pretty much what I've got in stock. I've got a few more things at home. But I'm about to do a big batch with a contract manufacturer. Those things are ready. The hardware has been finished since November. So um, I'm, I'm about to do a batch of, of things. So uh, I will take orders when people want to. And you can just send me an email. Or my phone number is also on the website, on the CP Maker. You can do makerlisp.com. You can do cpmaker.com. That's my website. My email and my phone number are there. So. Um, uh, the special deal, it's like if, if you want to buy the whole shebang like that, for the first 10 buyers, it's 375 These prices will come down. Um, you know, this is the price based on doing a batch of 20 
Um, when I can sell 50 or 100 at a time, prices will come way, way down. But right now, that's, that's where they are. So, um, so before your talk began, you uh, showed me how you could... Oh, right, thank you. Oh, yeah, so I have a few more show and tell things here. Now we'll be very informal. Um, no more presentation. And I'll jump in and do any kind of like, you know, coding kinds of things that you'd like to see. But it's also meant to be kind of like a maker top, you know, a, a, a portable thing. And there's space under here, and there's a, you see that there's a little pouch to hold your cables, and it's all held together. So, you can take it apart, and so this is in the packed to go configuration. But you take these straps off, and you lift up this, and then your stand, that wireframe stand, is, it has been stored under here, and you set this up on here, and then your project board can just flip over. So if I disconnect this right now, which I will, I'm things are good enough. Um, I'll just take all these things off here. And Arthur saw when I came in and unpacked this. But basically, here's your project board, everything on it. You flip it over, you put it down, you put it back together like we had it over there, and the whole thing goes. And then there's a bag you can put it in. And so it all fits, and here's a little pillow for the keyboard to protect it, and the whole thing fits under there. So that's kind of the to-go, teacher prepare the lesson at home and take it back to the lab for the next day. And of course, you know, because this comes off, you can take this home and do your programming, put it in your shirt pocket, you know, use the SD card, copy things back and forth, come back to the lab, snap it back down on your, on your um, expander board that's on the, on the enclosure and you're ready to go. So there's a lot of different ways you can use it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, that's the pack up, unpack demonstration. Go ahead. You have array in your language? Uh, a what? I have vectors, yeah. I have vectors, and they can be vectors of vectors of vectors of vectors. There's a limit. There's only 1,024 elements in a vector allowed. But yes, we have vectors, and in fact, uh, I've got examples that use vectors. So, for example, in the, where did I put my glasses? In the time and date functions, I got, I've got an example. I use, you know, a vector of the the symbols. Um, let me get out of here and just let you see the the code. Uh, is it there? No, it's at the top level. It's right here. So, for example, can we see that? Um, let me. date to day of week and you pass in year, month, and day and we have this temporary variable T which is for adjustments um, but let's see, where have I got that's the, that's the adjust, that's the date to day of week and where did I, where did I put the vector with the I've got it here somewhere Oh, there it is. Get date symbol in familiar format. Define days to be the vector of these symbols here. And then you index into the vector. And vector is like list. You need to take all its arguments and make a vector. There's also a list to vector and a vector to list that let you go back and forth. And then vref says reference from the vector days this index. And that's how you... So the time and date functions use vectors. I've got other sample test programs that do that. So yes, we have vectors. So you had a question? Um, I was wondering about uh, best ways. I know you're not doing IoT, but, uh, mm -hmm. but 
machines? Yeah, so I'm going to do that. Um, um, excuse me? Oh, I'm sorry. How do we communicate in an IoT fashion, even though it wasn't designed to do how we do, how do we do networking or reaching things? So um, I'm going to have a number of different things. Um, there are these modules from Microelectronica, which is a very simple, and then they're called, um, what are they called? There's, there's these little modules, and um, they're called clickboards. They're called clickboards. And the receptacle that you need for that is this small 16-pin dual 2-8-pin two, two headers, and you snap these clickboards down on it. And they communicate over very generic interfaces like SPI, I squared C, serial port, and there might be one other. So I've, the mechanisms I'm using for interfacing here are SPI and serial port and GPIO. So I plan on having a Wi-Fi. There's a Wi-Fi clickboard. There's also Ethernet clickboards and stuff like that. I plan on having a board like this that has clickboard receptacles on it, and you can talk to it that way. And you'll be talking either through SP, usually probably through SPI or serial port access to that clickboard, which then turns it into Wi-Fi transmissions. Um, there's actually, the EZ80 actually has an Ethernet controller inside, but I haven't broken it out into this uh, expansion board, but I may. So, um, so there are ways to do that kind of thing, and it's coming. But I very much did not want to focus and target, you know, like trying to do Raspberry Pi with this uh, or trying to do exactly like, you know, a Linux kind of Internet-enabled you're not going to play movies on this. You're not going to, you know, do your web browsing on this. It's kind of targeted to this this kind of a focus. But all those things are possible, and so those those will come. But I, I wanted to get enough hardware together that it was, you know, sort of fully functional, and you could do a little computer kind of thing on it, and you could do your Arduino kind of thing, but with a nicer programming environment and self-hosted rather than cross-development. Um, and so you could get started doing the same kinds of things you could do with an Arduino board. But eventually, um, I'll probably have some kind of internet, you know, some kind of transport kind of thing. But I wanted to get enough out there that it was ready to go and start it going and then see where that takes me. A, a similar question is uh, you said you built native GPIO on the board. Uh huh. Um, if you had multiple boards, you wanted to have some array of processors uh -huh. to create and they, they intercommunicate. Recommend you use the GPIO? No, I would use the SP. Well, the, the GPIO pins are, are multiplexed with the internal peripherals. And so you set and enable in the definition of which pin is which, whether you want it to be a classic GPIO input, output, edge trigger, sense, all those kinds of things. And then you can also say, no, I don't want to do that. I want you to connect it to the internal peripheral. So several of these are connected to the SPI. And SPI is being used to communicate with the SD card. But SPI is a bus. So you can just hang a lot of things off it. So if I was going to have several of these things talking to each other, I'd have them talking over SPI and then dedicate um, certain GPIOs for the select on the SPI. So that's how I would probably do it. And they all can, can coordinate uh, incoming mess whatever message. Well, the way SPI works is it is a bus, and whoever's the master at that time, and either side can be the master. Like the, you know, the other, the the remote device that's not the computer can be the master, and the computer can be the master, and you kind of arbitrate at an outside level in order to do that. You say, I, I want to be the master, and somebody responds and says, Okay, I'll get off the bus. You do that, and so. That, that whole thing can be, and then there's individual selects for each individual device. So you do burn up, it, rather than having an encoded address that you're sending as part of the transaction, like in I2C, you just have a very simple transport, and then you dedicate sideband signals or out-of-band signals, other, other signals to control the select and whether the thing responds you know, to what's happening um, over the SPI. So that's, that's how you do it. So it, it's not the, you know, you can't, it wouldn't be practical to have 100 of these. 
But you could get two or three or four wired up and they would work properly. So that, and, and I think there's a length limit also on, on SPI, but um, you know, a few of these next to each other would probably work fine. No, no, you, you wouldn't want to build a, a massively parallel thing out of this. Do you have any sort of uh, elaborate demos or anything like that that you've written? Uh, so the question is, do I have elaborate demos or anything like that? I have a few. I have like a um, uh, switching yard algorithm expression calculator run in this list. I have, I have one that I can start. Well, I can't start it now because I just turned everything off. But I have something that does color text and runs through the different text colors and shows the character display. Um, I have a, I have a few things. Um, the best demonstrations of the language are all the macros and functions that implement the rest of the language. When you read those, if you understand those, then it's like you're you're there. So it's, this one is here, and did where did I put where did I put the Okay, I've got that, I've got that. Now I just need this. The slowest thing in this system is the SD card. But, um, so I have a blinky. Oh, sorry, I spelled that wrong. I forgot my first friend. Oh, the other thing is you can buy this display. Where is it? You can buy this display. There, it's blinking. Um, so that's, you know, direct register access from Lisp. Um, you can buy this display on Amazon or various different other places. It's called an Elecro 10.1 inch high resolution display. It's used with a lot of Raspberry Pi projects. You can buy this keyboard. It's a Vortex Core. You can buy it on Amazon or Mechanical Keyboards. This is about $100. That's about $100. Um, so obviously the enclosure was designed. You know, I, I kind of looked for the key, USB keyboard and the display that would do what I wanted it to do, and I kind of designed the enclosure around it. And the enclosure was first done as a 3D printed thing in ABS. First it was in PLA. And PLA melts in Phoenix, so so I'd, I'd, I'd put the thing in the, my trunk and drive out to show somebody. It was like all deformed and didn't work. And then we did one in ABS, but ABS kind of cracks sometimes through the process, so that didn't work out. So, but in designing this and getting all the all the mechanical drawing data and everything like that, then the the fellow who did this for me, you know, transformed it into a laser cut wood design. Go ahead. Are Say that again. Is that a model available? You can. Um, I can make this available. I'm not offering this for sale right away, but I'm going to post all the data. So, and and if you want help getting this printed, we will do that. You know. So yes, you can. I do intend. Uh, right now, we made some changes to this to make it, and then we're kind of backporting those changes into this model. But yeah, you can print one. We'll give you the data to, to let you print this. Um, so that's that. I can start that other demo. So as you can see, first you have to load it off the SD card, and then of course it goes through that, you know, the the jitting process. Um, most of that time is the SD card. But so this is just. This is just the colors and showing the palette, and it's actually printing the, the program itself. That this program that's running, that's the program. And so, but it, you can see kind of the concatenated symbol um, use, and you know, kind of get the sense of this. I think this stuff will. Anybody who's familiar with Scheme or other lists, when you read this, you'll you'll see what it really is doing, and just. You have a couple of questions like, oh, what does that function do? But other than that, you know, I think it looks pretty much like, like you would expect it to look. Um, let's see, I have a, 
you know, I have the, the benchmark program. And that takes about 74 seconds to run the first time and 71 seconds after that. So, you know, it prints the time and then it's, it's going to do its, you know, it's going to do a thousand of those Takeuchi functions and then it's going to print the time. So I, I've got a bunch of stuff, but um, more than I can really go through right now. You said the SD card was the slowest part, so it probably isn't worth uh, saving the post jitted code to disk? It's a possibility. It's a possibility. Um, the, yeah, it, I've considered having like a save and restore in this system. I don't have that um, because, partly because I don't want to export the environment and import the in environment, and that's kind of difficult. It could be done, but I, so, um, but I haven't done that. And then also the way the JIT execution engine runs, it patches the virtual machine instructions in place of the original Lisp. And the, fun the closure object has an, a an object which references the environment, but that's only true in the environment that is here. So if I want to export pre-JITted functions, I have to have a way to import and export an entire environment off the disk. And that still might be, you might be right, that might be a, a very good um, you know, thing to do, but I haven't done that. And if the SD card is a bottleneck, then it's maybe not worth it? Anyway. It might not be. I mean, the, the jitting process itself is, is not really the slow part. It's really just, and on this processor, the, I'm doing the SD card over SPI, and the SPI is about one megabyte per second. Um, and so there's only so much I, I can do there. But, um, that's, uh, but it's, a, it's a good point. How long will this be up? Um, well, here, you can just watch it again. I'm going to hit reset. It's, it's going to be a couple seconds. I mean, it's instantaneous if I take the SD card out. I saw a lot of colors going past. I wondered if you, that was after the boot up, so it was like under 10 seconds. Oh, well, yeah, for sure. Look, so here's, I'm resetting the processor, and I've popped out the SD card. So, oh, what's going on here? Oh, this button is, there, this button was a little stuck. But, so that, let me hit the reset there. So that's what that's what's happens to get up to, to Lisp. So, well, no, watch it. It's less than a second. Or it's about a second. Um, but then if I put the SD card in, I preload all the stuff that I need for back quote and auto load. Everything else is loaded on the fly. So this is a little slower. Oh, this this button is not. So that's, that's what goes on when you have to do all the file access to get you to your basic running system. That's like three seconds. It's about three seconds. But now almost still very little is, is defined here. So now when I run color demo or any of the other things that have a fair amount of code, they're doing a lot of auto loading and then expanding. Oh, Type that wrong. They're doing a lot of auto loading from the SD card and then bringing things in and applying macros and things like that. So, this is going to take a little longer to start. Of course, after it has started once, it's all sitting in memory and it'll start quickly the next time, you know, so I can do the same thing again. As you'll notice, I also have to develop a, a line editor for this just to make it a little bit more convenient. So the second time, it starts pretty quickly. So um, most of it is the SD card, as, as far as I can determine. And what you saw here is uh, this, this button. This board here was actually hand assembled. These boards were, um, were done in a production facility, you know, a contract assembler. That board was hand assembled, and that reset button is a little sticky. Um, I also have business cards here, so I, I hope you take some. Um. Um, so it seems like there's a lot of trade-off decisions that have to be made. Uh, the design is, like, mm -hmm. the architecture of the, um, of the list of the carbon fibers, etc. 
Uh huh. Oh yeah, a million times. Yeah. So um, I started this about seven years ago, and I was developing on Linux for all that time. But I always knew I wanted to come to a machine sort of like this. And originally, I thought I was going to be on one of Microchip's products. Microchip has MIPS processors, and I really like MIPS. Um, so I was planning on, but then they didn't make really big MIPS processors. And then they made some bigger ones, but I didn't like some of the things that, some of the features in some of the bigger ones. So I was targeting this MIPS processor with 128K of memory total. And so, and that was not external memory, that's just in the chip. So I did a lot of things like the forgetting so that a macros happen and you can forget them so they don't sit around. And the garbage collection, I did a lot of those things running on Linux with the memory turned way down to like 16K or 32K or 128K, just watching the trade-offs. So a lot of those decisions, it's like I eventually want to get on a machine like this. And I said, you know, sort of like made the, the Lisp target the capabilities and the size of the machine I wanted to get on before I had designed the machine. And I was looking for processors. It's kind of funny how I decided on the EZ80. I said, okay, I'm just going around and around and around. I can't get what I want. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to do a blind search on DigiKey. And I just need two parameters. I need it to be less than $10, and I need at least a megabyte of memory. And what came up was two Z80 processors. And I said, oh, that's a bonus because now I can run CPM, you know. So, um, so that's how I got started with that. And then I, so about seven years of devel development on Linux, then I was going to retire from microchip. I started the project properly in April. I had it, I ported it from Linux to um, this machine, which was together enough that it could run this. It wasn't, you know, I didn't have all these things. I, at first I had these development boards from Microchip and Zilog kind of all connected together and I'm using like 10% of what is on those boards, but I sort of knew what I wanted. So I didn't have the machine complete yet, but um, I was going to the Vintage Computer Festival um, in, where was that? It was, it was here in town somewhere. What? Computer History Museum. Yeah, right. So in Sunnyvale, I think. Or Mountain View, right. So I was going to that, so I said, oh, I better buckle down and get this thing ported. So that took about, you know, a week and a half, two weeks. Um, you know, first it ran, but it wasn't like doing everything ideally. And uh, I'd noticed things that Linux has a very fast file system, and I don't have a fast file system. So suddenly, things that I had been doing kind of like repetitively and redundantly in the auto load, it's like, oh, don't want to do that. So um, April, I left microchip, started the project properly. August, I had the thing running on a machine that looks kind of close to this. By November, I had all the pieces of hardware that you see here. And uh, then I was engaging with a couple of different websites to try to market this. And I was on Crowd Supply for a little while, and I decided to go a different direction. So, uh, but you can buy them. I'll have a, a commerce e-commerce page on my website pretty soon. So, it's kind of like if you go way back to you know biblical times, you know for my, most of my life I've always wanted to build a system like this. Then I was retiring. Then I was thinking, you know, and then I had been building a Lisp system in the background nights and weekends for seven years. Then I finally retired. Then I decided what kind of machine I wanted to, to base it on. Then I ported to the machine. Now I'm trying to make and sell the machines. So that, that was kind of the journey. Uh, I just have one more question. Um, I'm not familiar with the chaining article. Like how close to what the, um, the article described is your garbage collector? And like how much, how much of it is kind of like your own... Uh, I, like, you don't have to be listening to it, like how, how much is novel? The, the, is yeah, the question like, is, how, compared to the traditional Cheney garbage collection, how much is new stuff and how much is the same? So I have switches in the, I have a switch in the code that you can turn off that top corral feature. Then it's almost exactly like the Wikipedia article. And it's classic and it's like, you know, give due to the, the original author, it's that algorithm. You might look at the coding and you might see that the coding is like interesting or 
you might like the compactness of the coding, but it's basically that algorithm. Then the top corral thing is kind of my generational right barrier thing, and th that is my, um, my trick. Um, I had another trick that I used to use that I turned off because it wasn't really as, as, a, as effective as I thought it was, uh, certainly not on this machine. There's another place where you can defer a garbage collection. And one of the things you can do is there's one time in the history of the world in a LISP system like this where you know something is never going to come back. And that's when you pop something off the stack. The, the pair cell that you used to reference the value that you've popped off the stack, that is never going to be used again. You can't get to, you can't really get to the stack. You can put things on the stack, you can put things, take things off the stack, but you cannot really get to the, I mean, if you do the Lisp thing as returning the, the S, the, the stack pointer, then you are in a way getting to the stack. But in general, when you pop things off the stack, the cell that was the link in the list ain't going to be used again. There's nobody who's pointing to it. So for a while, I had this thing working like when I would pop something off the stack, I'd take that cell and put it on a list, and when I needed to make a new pair, I would first check and pull that off the, that, that list of the disposed of stack pair cells. Um, and I did that, and it works, and it actually defers um, garbage collection for quite some time. In a lot of these things, you'll do like one-third the number of collections. But it wasn't the right trade-off, because that checking to be on the list rather than just extending the heap it's slower, you know. So it, in, on balance, uh, it was it was not the right trade-off for performance. But it, that is also a trick that I hadn't seen anywhere else. So I, I, when I developed this garbage collection, I then said, "Oh, I better. I, I wonder if anybody else is doing something like this." So there's this nice survey article by Paul Wilson where he goes over all of the different um, garbage collection over the last 30 or 50 years, and I saw some interesting stuff in there, and I thought, oh, yeah, this is kind of like generation. I mean, I knew what generational was before that, but uh, this is kind of like generational. This is kind of like right barrier. So I'll use those words because people will know what that means. But I did not find this algorithm in there. So I, I think there is a twist here. I, I prefer to think of it like it's just like a recipe. Like when you're, when you're cooking, you didn't invent food, but you might put things together in a way that's an interesting recipe. So I think this is an interesting recipe for some applications of garbage collection, but I don't really think it's kind of like a new algorithm or anything like that. So that's, that's um, but you can turn off the, the feature and then it's exactly like a Cheney collector. So a couple of questions. Are you running in the 16 or 24 bit mode of the EGA? 24 bit, the question is what mode? I'm running in the 24 bit mode. So you're using Yes, absolutely. No, no. Um, and then, uh, uh, are you doing anything with environment on it, or you know, like beyond just a simple REPL? Are you actually trying to build out additional software tools, and make it some sort of self-hosting, or anything like that? Or yeah. Um, so, I th I actually don't think I'll make a living making these machines and selling hardware. You know, so everything's going to be open. All the software is going to be posted. I'm going to post the schematics and bills of material. I'm going to put a lot of information out there so that people can see what's going on. I don't think I'll actually make any money doing this. But I do think if the platform is interesting to people, there might be some work helping people. I've done a lot of embedded control over the years. So I might be able to help people either develop a course around this so that it's, it's a way to talk about both LISP and um, digital interfacing to, you know, different kinds of hardware. Um, or as a real-time control thing for somebody who's more comfortable programming in a LISP-like language and or doesn't want to do MicroPython but wants to have some kind of leverage rather than getting straight down to the C and assembly. So I think, I think maybe some consulting will come out of this. Um, I, will develop, I, mean, I, I will develop more tools and things that run on this, like I don't have an editor yet, so I have to have an editor before I ship. So um, there will be other utilities and things that I'll do, but um, I, I don't know. I'm just going to see where it takes me.
Well, thank you. Well, thank you.